Hey, aloha everybody. Welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii Studios. I'm Andrew Lanning, the security guy. Uh, we've got another exciting episode of Security Matters for you today, and I've got an amazing guest. Um, we're going to talk about something that's um, maybe, maybe in some parts of the world going well, maybe in others not so well. Uh, crisis management, uh, crisis leadership. Um, Dr. Terry Rossi is with us today, and she uh, did her dissertation in this work. Um, you've got a wide range of skills, Terry. So I really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for the introduction. Um, now, I want to first get our audience a little bit of an introduction. We met at, at InfraGuard last year, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, go ahead and give us some of your background so the audience kind of knows uh, what you're bringing to the table today, because it's quite varied and exciting, I think. Okay. Um, like I mentioned before, I did go off and join the military against wishes uh, right out of high school and spent four years in the Army. And when I left the Army, I knew that I wanted to go to college and ultimately did. Um, spent several years in college. Then I got a job. I was um, my first degree is a bachelor's in biology, my master's is in genetics. And then I went to work in a lab as a staff scientist doing molecular genetics work for 10 years. And at some point, 2008, I got asked to be a director. And life as a director is very different from a scientist because now you have to care about things like cost and meetings and things working very well. So my whole dynamics changed. I had to generate some you know, revenue, so I created a, a Certificate program in Chem Bio Rad Nuke Defense. Uh, we're right next door to Wright Pat Air Force Base. We have Battelle Industries up in Columbus nearby. And so we're perfect to do some Homeland Security um, things. And because we are in a medical school, everything has a medical approach. Now, um, prior to COVID, when I would talk about healthcare, Homeland Security, People usually did not see the connection. Now I talk about healthcare and homeland security, they get it right away. Um, you know, usually I have to sell them with the whole, we need the healthcare professionals at the at the table making decisions and they have to come prepare. I would just get this look of, you know, people not understanding, sorry. <laughs> and, um, but now it's, it's clear that they have to have that background and that's kind of like my soapbox. Ah, nice. Um, how, so did you do, did you do um, uh, bio, bio, you know, radiation hazard stuff? Did you do that in the army and you brought that with you, that interest? Yeah. Okay, I did awesome. it in Let's the do. army. So, and I up, uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Um, I did, yes, I did those um, in the army. And so when I stepped up as director, we already had chem class happening, chem agents, and we had a bio agent class taught by our adjunct faculty from Battelle. What I did is I created one based off of case studies, um, another course, and then that developed into a um, certificate defense, uh, Seaburn defense program. And back in 2013, the FBI, you know, our close friends, said, they wanted to send some of their people through, the Secret Service wanted to send their people through. So we got a special government rate where government people can take our program for in-state tuition, which was really a wonderful accomplishment. That's awesome, congratulations. Um, did, uh, so um, you're also, I mean, you're an author. Tell, when did you start writing books? I gotta, I gotta know about this because I think everybody like wants to write a book, but not many do. I do have You've written several, behind so. me. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to show you my, there. So. Awesome. See? So, um, you know, just a variety. <laughs> um, my first book I did, connection book, was in 2013. And it's called Weapons of Mass Psychological Destruction. I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared to like show you guys. So I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Weapons of Mass Psychological Destruction and the people that use them. Because as you know, my um, I have several areas of research. One is decision-making, crisis decision-making, and the other is um, terrorism. 
researching, not doing. And so my first book was about weapons of mass destruction and the people that use them. Then I uh, started doing uh, the research on the American terror, 519 American citizens charged with acts of terrorism. I looked at up to 50 different variables and identified patterns in the data and wrote a book. And that was the talk that you, you heard me give uh, at Quantico. And I got a little bored. I had some free time, so I started in fiction about an FBI agent, a female. She's, um, she's a bit emotional, drops cover, not a very good agent. And so I started a series and I found it a lot of fun. After writing academic books and, and chapters and journal articles to be able to write whatever I want and not necessarily tell the truth, it was, it was freeing in a way that I never expected. So. <laughs> That's so interesting. Um, are you are you continue going to continue with that series as well? Is that a nice outlet? I mean, now we're all stuck at home. Do you find yourself writing more or less? How, how's how's it going? I've I've been focusing on getting some papers out, and now that I have them all set up, I first one just published just, and so I do have. I think I'm going to have a few days. Uh, during writing a um, creating a qualitative test so I have to decide write a new fiction book or create a qualitative wow that's um it seems like you're using like so both sides of your brain all, all the time right you're keeping a good balance with that kind of with that you know doing that kind of work or both kinds of work I suppose um so I, I, I have so. to know you're also the president you're also the president of, of InfraGuard's chapter out there in Dayton. How's that going? And how'd you get involved with InfraGuard? Back in two, I have a Dayton think tank. Uh, it's a group of 50 top crisis leaders in our, um, in our region. I started it with our mayor, Nan Whaley, Dayton mayor. And basically I went to her with a list of subject matter experts, crisis leaders, and she gave me her list. And together we created this, um, this 50 member think tank. And I was there talking about EMPs. I had just read a book on EMPs. And one of the members of my think tank said, oh, you should join InfraGuard. So I, I met with the, the president and he said, oh yeah, come on board. And I ended up giving them a talk and I went to Congress that year. And so for those of you that do not know, Congress is InfraGuard's annual meeting. And we team up with, um, with ASIS and it just happened that at that conference, I got to meet the author of the book that got me started into InfraGuard. So it was a really cool circle. Um, and because the think tank and InfraGuard is so well aligned, I'm able to have speakers for both, both groups. And ultimately what we're hoping to do is to work with my university and create a, a center, a healthcare, uh, excuse me, Homeland Security kind of fusion center, teaming up InfraGuard, the think tank, and and the university, and Wright Pat Air Force Base, and Patel, and anybody else that wants to be. <laughs> That's awesome. So you're facilitating a whole lot of stuff on behalf of Homeland Security, and uh, we need that. Thank you so much for the work that you do. I know it keeps you busy. Um, so now we can get now we can get to a, the maybe a little more the meat of our topic today. So um, okay. crisis leadership. Um, talk to us a little bit about how first of all you got interested in that because it's obviously top of mind for everyone today we've seen a lot of bad examples so we'll get into some of the features and some of the some of the um uh the work you know and some of the notes that you sent me as well but um how how did it come to your attention that you know this is a, something that we need to pay attention to faculty meetings well faculty meetings are not really crisis of well sometimes they're crisis events depends <laughs> on how you do my crisis, but I ended up going to a lot of faculty meetings. And like I said, as an administrator, you look at them differently and you look at them as, are they a waste of time? And I don't know if you go to any meeting, Andrew, but a lot of people think it's time to find out why. And also we're making decisions and we're voting, we're voting on things that uh, we don't really know if we have that support. So initially it was just looking at meetings. And then as my interest in Homeland Security grew, so did my my subject matter, and that was crisis leadership. And so what it is, I reached out to 15 
global experts. In fact, one of them should be listening to us right now. Um, I can't give names. And um, I asked them, I, I looked at seven different making models, broke them down, deconstructed them into fifth process traits. And I asked them, which of these do you use? And based off of their, their feedback, I was able to I, develop a, a decision-making model. And the reason this is important is because the current decision-making model was actually a 25-year-old decision-making model, also created at Wright Pet Air Force Base, so down the road. And that model worked 25 years ago, but it doesn't work now. And because we're no longer making decisions by one person using gut instinct and experience, because a lot of things that we're experiencing now, we don't have that experience. And so by creating a new model, we can, we can first identify, um, you know, the situation awareness, who should be at the table and the process of, of decision making itself. And so that's what, what that's what the was about. But in addition into that and um, something that I find really interesting, especially nowadays and yesterday that I read about uh, is the stress. And what I meant by yesterday is I read about how a Manhattan ER doctor just committed suicide. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this kind of work is the stress that affects crisis decision makers. This kind of stress is, is, is unlike anything other leaders experience. If a crisis decision maker makes a bad uh, decision, people die or we go to war and property damage. And the stress involved in doing that, both on them and in the decision making process, can be overwhelming. And for one to recognize that, you know, experiencing it, uh, it's, it's very typical. And that way they can feel comfortable about getting help. Hmm. Our, um, so the old model that we talked about, um, there's been a, I think in, in, in industry and in business in, in the world, there's been a recognition that, you know, one guy can't do it alone. One person can't do these things alone. Is that part of what has changed, you think, in crisis leadership? Do we used to look at a leader and say, figure it out, that's your job, and leave them on an island to do it and so they, they could make a good or bad decision and we all just had to live with it? And now there's maybe a, is there more of a recognition that it, that with, with more thought, with more input uh, person, you know, from others, you know, that maybe have expertise that a leader doesn't have, um, that it's okay and for them to, to make a better decision? Is that, is that part of what's changed? Absolutely. And, and the other model, um, and I'm not saying that the model was bad, the model just really well 25 years ago. The other model was the leader, you know, have, think, I mean, this is, the model actually says this. And so they think, when have they experienced this before? If they've never experienced it before, I can do research and revisit. So it's like a feedback loop. And until that process is like, oh, Okay, now I know what I'm gonna do, and now let's do it. As opposed to a group of people sitting around a table. Now, the people at the table depends on the crisis itself. For example, if we had an active shooter event in a school, we might want the the school counselor, we may want the the janitorial staff, we may want a different set of people at the table. It's not necessarily the highest paid people at the table, um, because somebody that works a custodial worker is going to know say you know some different paths to get out of the building or some things that that the principal would not know yeah that definitely takes um, a, a lot of different perspectives to manage uh, through a crisis um let's uh we've got to take a break um pay some bills we'll be back uh in just about one minute hold on everybody Aloha, I'm Katherine Knorr, the host of Much More on Medicine on ThinkTech Hawaii. Much More on Medicine is an opportunity to learn about all aspects of healthcare. I talk with guests about medical and alternative care treatment, insurance, medication, surgery, rehabilitation, prevention, and much more. We are streamed live on ThinkTech bi-weekly at 3 p.m. on Wednesdays. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo and aloha.
hello hi everybody welcome back to the studio uh we're talking about crisis leadership and um i know that uh you've probably seen different examples of that from your mayor from your governor from our president lately um we're trying to figure out what's changed and why um dr arosi's with us today and um we're just getting into some of these traits from the, the model we used to have versus a model we have today and maybe we're we're not um as i guess uh, reliant on a leader to, to bring us through a crisis. Crisis is situational. And uh, just because a guy can figure out what to do in one instance, maybe or a person can figure out what to do in one instance, maybe they can't figure out what to do in every instance, and they've got to get more help. So let's talk about the new model, um, Terry, that that um, sort of some of these traits that you discovered that uh, uh, can maybe we can pick out who's a good crisis leader and uh, when we need them. Well, the traits really, really um, worked with three different areas. One is situational awareness. Uh, when you're going into a crisis, what are the what are the capabilities of the organization or the people that are making the decisions? What are the laws surrounding? Like you can't just go and take over a, a, a school to use for uh, for relief. You have to have you have these stakeholders. Um, so it's it's all what when you go into this into the situation what to experience and then of course the second one which was the group dynamics and and it takes a team and the makeup of that team is going to decide whether or not your options are are well thought out if they're valid if you if you played them through and then the last thing is actual de decision making and that's making those decisions in this case ranking them proved to be a really good idea because you may have a team of 10 and five of those people, you may choose their first favorite answer, but of the other remaining five, it may be their second favorite answer. And so you really get a big picture when you go out with that, with that decision to do that, you know the kind of support you have. So looking at more than just yays and nays, raising of a hand to say yes or no, um, you're, you're getting a fuller picture. And with that support, you can, you can move forward with that decision with confidence. Huh. Is um is time a factor? You know, crisis always seems to me to want to be. You know, it's all of this immediately. We've got to do something, right? And some people are really good in the heat of the moment, in the heat of battle, things like that. And some crumble. You know, they fail. Um, is is ta the time that's needed? Would, did that come into play at all for you know making a decision or for or being a good leader in a crisis? You know, learning how to slow down instead of speed up, maybe or. Time was was absolutely you know relevant, and it surprised me because I expected the feedback for the decision process to be something more gut reaction, something like okay we've done this before, this is how we're going to act. But in fact, they did choose. You look at, you explore all the options, and you rank the options, and it seemed much more time time taking than maybe what you would expect. But again, we're talking about mm. people that may die, you know, the victims that are involved in the loss of, loss of life, loss of land. You can't just make those quick decisions without taking into consideration all the options. So while I expected it much probably like you, that the response would be much, um, that you would make more uh, timely, fast answers, responses, it showed based off of these uh, experts that there, it's much more thought out. Is um, do you have a, a guess or any data on like how many of our leaders are good crisis leaders? Is it a is it a one out of ten? Is it a you know should should the world really be worried or will they get together and figure this out? <laughs> so there's a secret that many of them do. Oh. If they're not confident with their choices, they look to the next to the next biggest person so they get blamed if they make a bad i um make a make a bad decision so for example if i'm if i'm say you know the mayor of dayton nan whaley and want to decide whether or not to lock down the city and i'm afraid of the repercussions i may look to columbus or cincinnati the next biggest cities and see what decisions they make because I did do it and we're both making a bad decision all the focus the media attention is going to be on the bigger cities so I'm, I'm just using them as an example Nan Whaley is amazing she's done a lot of great things for Dayton 
Uh, I think she's a great crisis leader. And we've had our share of crisis over the past year. Mm. Yeah, it, um, it, it's interesting. Our, it kind of, it's something to be a little bit worrisome if we have, you know, it's like having um, a group think problem, right? Where all the, the leaders who aren't sure all look at one who is, and then they all follow that path. So that, you know, it's like, um, well, that's what they did. So that's what we'll do. That's, that's an interesting dilemma. But I guess, you know, it, given, um, you know, a weak leader who can't collaborate with his team or doesn't trust them or something, obviously he's going to have to make a decision, from, you know, from somewhere. So looking at what others have done, maybe from a similar circumstance could be, I guess, valuable. I mean, it's kind of like if it happens to be that you're following someone who made a smart decision, then you're, you're lucky. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, are, you what, uh, are you, um, are you teaching, um, crisis leadership as well? Do you, is that an element of the work that you guys do at, um, at the university? I am teaching a Homeland Security course that involves crisis decision making. I teach a, I teach a leadership class that takes all these same um, leadership skills and pulls them together to work for crisis or non-crisis um, situations. And I teach a few other classes. Do, um, did you, are you working this uh, decision model into your book, into any of the characters? No, I, I don't, but I should. <laughs> Except for their FBI, which, you know, it, the people, the, the agents are not really the decision makers. So she just, in this case, she just goes and does whatever she wants. I see. Okay, okay. Um, are there, um, are there other opportunities to share the, the model that you, you know, that you, that you've, uh, you know, forwarded? I mean, are there, um, are there some other places or some other uh, teaching or things that have sprung up around that to sort of take that forward? Because, I mean, this is something that obviously we have a lot of maybe officials today who have never had to manage in a crisis. And so that, that you know, the, the leadership model, something they can put their hands on and say, here's what I need to learn how to do uh, could be valuable, I think. There is, uh, you know, the work has been published, so you can Google me. Um, and find the, the publication that talks all about this. I think at my university webpage, I even have a link to a PowerPoint presentation for those that like pretty pictures. And, um, and you know, anybody that wants to reach out to me, I'd be happy to, to work them through, to help them to learn about it. And I was thinking, Andrew, you know, this is my first time visiting with you, but if you want me to, to maybe do this a couple more times, then um, maybe we should like send me to Hawaii in the middle of the winter and, and really, you know, work with your people, maybe a workshop, hit the beach. I get a lot of that. <laughs> I, we, I imagine we so. To, but we, no, well, we used to do, um, we used to have the shows only in the studio, so they had to be live. And so, you know, now we're doing everything virtual, which has been fun, but, uh, I'd love to get you out here to teach uh, maybe an infraguard session, uh, our NDIA group, AFCIA. We have a lot of um, opportunity out here to share. And, you know, we are on an island, so we don't, a lot of the people here have to travel to the mainland to get education, to get classes, you know. So if you're coming to Hawaii, now I don't know if I can get your trip funded, but if you're yeah. coming, uh, let me know. We'll definitely get you in front of some folks. So, you know, you don't really have to be there. If you want to do something like this, I would be happy to at any time. I do want to bring up one of the things um, when I was in the Dallas giving the talk on this on this um, at, at Congress, I did have a lot of people talk to me about using this as a crisis management plan. And so the idea was and all the I mean, it was like this big this big kind of group session after my talk, people from different organizations like AT&T um, and, and the Mercedes people. And and they're like, well, how can we use this? And so so together we worked on this concept of going through the, the model and using it for different scenarios and for the organization that they may experience. So, for example, I mentioned earlier about about schools with an active shooter, go through that scenario and then um, as a simulation. And then as this team works together on different simulations that could happen for that organization, you do that with the idea that you will know who you need to contact, who are the stakeholders, what are the numbers you need to know, 
what are the rules, et cetera. And that way, if you do have a crisis event, you can pull up that notebook with these different simulations and find the one that closely aligns with the event that you're experiencing. And that will save then hopefully time, money, lives, whatever the case may be. So using this model as an organization crisis management plan is something that I think is um, would, would be of value. Um, for example, if we experience this, I just see we have three minutes to close, so maybe I should shut up and let you talk. No, no, we're good. This is great. I, I love this whole idea. You know, this is this is a great idea for getting this information out, finding a way to share it. I, I love the situational application because I think that's where, uh, you know, a leader who's faced with a crisis that they are not prepared for, that's when they really need some different type of training. And that's when they have the least amount of time to get it. So, you know, teaching about it situationally, I think it's a great idea. I hope um, I hope some folks that are watching this today will reach out and grab your paper and we can find you on LinkedIn. Where else can we find you? At the university? Find me at the university, yes. Um, I did do my postdoc um, at the VA, um, Veterans Administration Medical Center in Dayton, in the simulation center. So a lot of the ideas that I have in terms of decision making and and crisis leadership stems from my experience there at the va so i want to give them a shout out awesome so. thanks terry thanks so much for joining us today and thanks for sharing it's great information i hope uh, people take advantage of it because you don't really want to wait till the crisis hits you to go figure out what to do and here's some help right in front of you thanks so much we'll talk again soon thanks everybody out All there right. stay safe and wash your hands aloha All right, we're all clear. Hey, thanks, Eric. Wow. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I didn't have my chat window open.